Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to see a gameplay between Bassem Amin, himself a big expert of the King's Indian, playing against Alexei Fedorov, and after a slightly unusual English modern move order, we do ultimately get back to a normal King's Indian, and yeah, this is only going to be a video where we're going to start looking at some alternative repertoires, where, you know, I mainly focus on a move Knight F3, and this does, of course, give White a big advantage of correct play. But I also think it's very good for our understanding to see how other types of positions play out. And also gives you a little bit of variety as well. Like, let's say if, for example, you've played this in the last 20 games in a row and you want something different. Well, I've mentioned before that in this cup operation, you often have several moves that give white an advantage. And the move d5 here, while I don't think it's quite as promising as knight f3, does still give white an edge with correct play. And so in this game between, I mean, Fedorov, we see after e6, bishop d3, ED5 that we are recapturing with E takes D5 and you know, not giving black as usual. But only counterplay with B5, but just having a very nice grip over the uh, the center. Um, by the way, I will point out, it seems the best time to point out that if black does play it like a Benko with B5, it's something you might face in some games online, but it's really nothing to fear. Like you just meet A6 with A4 and that allows you to have a very nice hold over the B5 square. That means if they do take, you can just kind of shut down all of their play down to A file and B file. For example, if bishop A6, we just develop normally. Um, and if we take, we're actually quite happy to take with the pawn, even though it damages our structure. Because in this arising position here, we see that the pawn on B5 really negates the counterplay down the B file. Black can't really go and try to win it because we're just too fast to go knight D2, knight C4 and kick the queen back. And for now, I mean, maybe you can even go knight a5, knight c6 as well to really put the boot in. So nothing black can do here really is going to work. Why well, he's just basically up a pawn for nothing with the better position. Uh, some tricky players may try something like queen a5 and you know, try to set up some cheap knight e4 tactics. But as long as you remember to go bishop d2 and just break the pin, then the queen just ends up being a bit misplaced on, uh, on a5. Uh, for example, queen b4 is not really cutting it here. There are many good moves you can play, like... Even bishop d3 is technically fine. Also queen c2 if you just want to keep these pawns defended and maybe take back in one go on b5. That's also going to give white a pretty nice advantage here. Um, so yeah, just play whichever move you like because pretty much everything is going to be very good for white. Um, and just to explain, you can't play queen takes b2 as black because your queen will get trapped after rook b1 and rook b3, you know, just in case this, this wasn't obvious already. Um, but yeah, you don't really need to worry too much about the Benko, so we are going to focus more on the way the game played out, where Black tried to benefit from the move order by playing Knight A6 here. Um, for moves like Rook E8, this is something we will cover in a bit of depth in a later video, because this position actually transposes to one. They could also get via some delayed Benoni move orders, like say if they went C5, E6, but didn't play ED5 quickly. Um, and anyway, yeah, just a better topic for another video. But anyway, after ED5, knight a6, white played a move knight to f3 here, just developing normally. Uh, with this specific move order, you could also consider a3 just to avoid knight b4, and it might be a more practical move order, but the position after knight a3 is one you could get by a few different move orders, so it's good to know how it plays out, and the game itself is pretty instructive, where black sides go knight b4. Um, you can also play for a b5 break in these positions, like knight c7 and then b5. The first problem though is that we can stop it by playing a4 ourselves and sort of saying that a b4 square is actually not going to be as good for black as it looks here. Like the knight might be on an outpost but it doesn't really have any scope and meanwhile we can just sort of play in the center and just attack the weakness on d6 while it's not a lot black can really do in contrast. Um, and if black does say go b5 first then I mean you can kind of just take the pawn and be better. It's not really working out so well for black because we are just keeping the the d5 pawn alive you know queen b3 and and bishop c4 and and so on so black's only way to really get counterplay here is to play knight b4 and after bishop b2 bishop f5 like in the game and this leads to a bit of a long forcing variation that strictly speaking you don't really need to memorize because you can avoid it with being a bit clever with the move order like playing a3 before they go knight b4 as i mentioned before but I think the rising position is very instructive and worth having a look at. So rook c1, knight e4. This is what black's aiming for, you know, trying to get very active play with his bishops, but white is up to the task and plays the move g4. Interesting enough, actually, this 
whole variation up to the first, I believe, 24 moves actually was also playing in with Bassem in with Black. But he was quite lucky to draw and you know, I have the feeling probably that game he nearly lost as Black inspired him to play this as White. So Black goes Knight A2, you know, realizing that if you're going to lose material, at least get what you can for it. Black now plays Queen F6, hitting two pawns at once. We simply trade one of them off. And Black now plays Queen take C3, take, take. And we get actually a fairly typical endgame for this sort of variation where, you know, materially speaking, Black does have two pawns and a rook. But a bishop and knight, which does seem like quite a lot. But white's pieces coordinate a lot better because the only open file for the rook is an e-file and we already have that blocked by our bishops. So again, continue bishop g7, rook b1, b6. h4 is a nice technical move by white, just sort of keeping the kingside pawns fixed in place. Uh, black goes rook fe8. Bishop d3, king f8. And now uh, a quite fun move by uh, Basem Amin. It's not the only move. I mean, playing, for example, bishop f4 and maneuvering to attack the d6 pawn is definitely a very worthwhile plan as well here. But Amin decides to go h5 directly with the idea that if black does take the pawn, which is the move that you know he had played in the game as black previously, well then white gets this f5 square for the knight and can really pile the pressure on d6. You're not even really sacking a pawn because you have rook h1 and rook h5 to get the pawn back anyway. Now, in his game, Amin played rookie free and you know, basically was just down a piece, but by some complete miracle managed to draw from this position. Uh, don't ask me how, but yeah, I mean, I think as long as White, you know, plays somewhat carefully and like doesn't allow too many pawns to get traded, it'll take time, but, you know, eventually he'll pile up on H F7, just create additional weaknesses in Black's camp and, you know, win on the, on the light squares, as it were. Uh, but going back, Black played the move a5 instead, trying to, you know, do something a bit different to get some counterplay of the a-pawn, supported by the bishop. It's an idea you sometimes see in the Grunfeld, but here it unfortunately just doesn't quite work. There are a few good lines for white, but I mean, play the absolute most precise with h6, getting the fawn pawn before they can think about taking it. Bishop f6, and, you know, rook b6 is technically winning, but even better is to play king b3. And just blockade the pawn with the king. So now this pawn is going to be a long-term weakness. B6 is a weakness. Certainly the D6 pawn is still a weakness. And ultimately Black is just not able to cover all of his weaknesses adequately. So the game concluded Bishop C6. White played Rook takes B6. Both obvious and good. Rook E B8. White played a good technical move of Rook B5. Like even though takes and King A4 is possible. It's just better to not give Black that counterplay down the down the b-file, like here it's a little bit more dicey in comparison. Whereas with rook b5, yeah, black might keep the a-pawn alive, but we have just complete domination of the position on the light squares, and probably the dark squares as well, given this bishop is not, you know, on its normal position, which means that we will be able to pile on the d6 pawn, which is what white does, bishop f4, hitting this guy. Now it's need to get the knight to the party, and black's position will just fall apart like a set of dominoes. Black played f5, trying to stop knight e4, but knight e6 is arguably even a better square for the knight. Rook b5, cb5, and there are just too many pass pawns, right? You know, we can push here, we can push here potentially. And in the game, white played a little combination with knight takes c5. The idea being that if black were to take the knight, b6, and black is not able to stop our pawn queening, the bishop just covers it perfectly. Black tried bishop d4, we had bishop g5, and... Finally, we had knight b7, take, take, king g8, knight c4, and given that white still has his two pieces for the rook, but also has, you know, a litany of past pawns that are just going to be too much for black to try and stop, uh, this is why black resigned in this position. So a pretty convincing win for white, and, you know, you can sort of see that even when we let black get a knight b4, which, like I said, you don't even technically have to do, you can play a3 and stop it here. White still gets a very nice advantage, and if Black does play out the whole forcing line, White's actually probably just winning on a technical level in the end game. And of course, it's quite instructive as well when you are mastering any opening to see how the typical end games play out as well. Uh, also, we saw yeah that B five is not really anything to fear. Just you know, play take A four, play normal moves like Queen A five, Bishop D two, and Black is not going to get any compensation for the pawn. So yeah, good luck with playing d5 in your games. In the next uh, videos, or next video, I will show you some games also where black does play e6 and you know, transpose back into 
one of the main lines of the delayed Benoni. So I'll see you there.